So this is Tiago and Ashley, and they had a unique kind of a story. You actually guys met at Lancaster Bible College. Yeah, we met at Lancaster Bible College. Yeah, good school? It is. Yeah. It's not an paid endorsement either. Just, we're just no. kind of check that out. And you're in school now. What's your degree? Social work. Social work. So basically, yes. yeah. Um, let's see. Making lots of money doing that. I understand. Yes. Tons. Okay. Yeah. No, not really. And you just gra- You're out. Yes, I just graduated. Yes. Uh, this past May. <laughs> yeah, they're they're in disbelief, Tiago. Because. Uh, and, and, and so tell me your story. You're out now, but uh, where were you born? Where'd you grow up? Okay. So yeah, um, I'm originally from Brazil. Um, I was born and raised there. Uh, my parents are missionaries. They are Brazilians and they're missionaries in Brazil. Actually now they live in Mozambique, Africa. But I was born and raised in Brazil and just had a typical life for a kid of a pastor, you know, if any of you guys Okay, here. Let's stop. A typical... <laughs> <laughs> okay, keep going. I said let that soak in. <laughs> typical life of a pastor's kid. Okay. Yep. So, um, growing up, going to church every Sunday and uh, having that as something normal, you know, uh, until basically I got to high school and uh, started making my own decisions and kind of felt like I was in charge of my life, you know, and it feels good at first because you, you just think that... Um, you're free and you're able to do whatever you want, um, but then you realize when you start making decisions, they're not beneficial to you to yourself. So, mm-hmm. so what happens after high school? You go to college? So yeah. So after high school, I was trying to figure out what my life was going to look like, and I honestly didn't want anything to do with the church. And uh, I also go to church with my family just for the looks. You know, my dad was the pastor. I couldn't be like, oh, I'm not going to church. Uh, <laughs> But. Could you talk to my kids maybe later? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I see one of them right here today. Good right job. You, know, you get a Christmas gift this year. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, but I've always had my mother, especially, as a prayer warrior in my life, you know. And after high school, as I'm trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life, um, I played soccer throughout high school in a semi pro level already. And I was, I was just trying to make it and, you know, so I had the opportunity to go to Europe and study at a Bible Institute, but I kind of saw that as an opportunity to go there and play soccer in Europe, you know, <laughs> so I was like, my parents showed me the option to go to Hungary in Europe and I was like, well, I'll, I'll take it, I'll go to Europe, leave abroad for a year, you know, maybe play there. And it was getting to Word of Life that God it was, it was when I got to Word of Life that God actually started working my life. Word of Life would be the Bible Institute. In Word of Hungary. Life, yeah, yeah. It, that's the Bible Institute in Hungary that I decided to go to. And if it wasn't for my, my parents' prayers, uh, the stage of life I was at, you know, and making a decision to go to a full-time Bible school, like, that didn't make sense in my, in my, in my life. But at, at, at some point, I decided to do that. Mm-hmm. Very good. So mom's prayer is a significant piece. Yes. Uh, my mom, she texts me every day, and she tells me uh, that she prayed for me, and she tells me what she prayed for me specifically. And that is a really big encouragement in my life. When I read those texts or uh, answer the phone, and she's telling me about that, that encouraged me to pray for them and to pray for my life, uh, to pray for us. You know, that is a really big encouragement in my life. That's pretty cool. So a mom prays every day texts you, giving you permission, <laughs> it's not a bad thing just to say praying for you. Yep. Yeah. And so she did that for you, which reminds you then to pray. Oh, yes. Uh, every time, sometimes I'll be having a busy day and just uh, doing, we know how life gets, and I'll, open my, I'll check my phone and there'll be a text message from her like, hey, I just pray for you, pray for your relationship, pray for your day. And at that exact moment, I just stop and I take my time to pray and to connect with God. And, and realize how important that is in my life. Wonderful. So you're at Lancaster, you, you meet so yeah, it a was, Southern Maryland girl. Uh, <laughs> I didn't just Google South Potomac Church and ended up here. <laughs> she, <laughs> she kind of brought me here. Because so. <laughs> we need help with our soccer team. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We can get one started. <laughs> she actually gets bonus points for bringing you. Yep. <laughs> So yeah, I came to Lancaster Bible College in 2015, um, and 
long story short, that's where I met Ashley, and yep. here we are today. Yeah, wonderful. Yep. So, Ash, tell us about yourself. Grew up here. Yes, I grew up in this area, so I grew up mainly in Indian Head. Mm -hmm. um, but just kind of in a nutshell, I'll share my story with you all today um, and just how it relates in the context of what we're talking about in the power of prayer. So um, my mom basically raised me and my family's here today, kind of in the front row and in the back there. Um, and Sweet. so, yeah. <laughs> They're just a huge part of my story and my life and just even why I'm here today. Um, but yeah, so my mom raised me and um, she did a great job and uh, she did a lot of it on her own, but definitely had support of other people. Um, but mainly for just what we're talking about today, I think I just would go ahead and start with around when I was like eight years old, I got saved and I got baptized in my church and I just was actively involved, you know, growing up in the church. I loved it. I had dreams and desires that God gave me to be involved in, in missions or, you know, maybe go overseas someday. Um, actively involved in the youth group and I love that. And whenever I was 13 years old, um, I just was going through a lot and my family and we kind of stopped going to church for a while um, and so I was kind of I just got really confused um, I didn't really understand why this like loving God that I had been learning about would allow some of the things that had happened in my life to happen um, and I just I, I kind of started I turned away from him and I, I started looking for the love that I was receiving at the church and, and from God and my relationship with him and friends and, and other things. And eventually that kind of escalated around 15 to um, turning to a lifestyle of drugs and alcohol. And um, by the time I was 17, I was heavily addicted to drugs and living a lifestyle of sin. And um, then eventually it was just my own choice. Um, choices and sin had caused a separation between me and God. And um, that was really difficult. But throughout this whole time, uh, my family, specifically my mom and my grandparents, were a constant and a consistent in my life, praying for me. Um, and while I had burned a lot of bridges, obviously, in that lifestyle and broken a lot of trust, and, and there were certain things like, that I knew that I had broken trust and broken relationship, but they were still there. They still loved me. They never turned their backs on me. I knew that they were praying for me, and I knew that they cared for me, um, and they still helped me when I was finally ready to get the help that I needed. They were right there with arms wide open um, just to be there for me um, and to help me get the help that mm -hmm. I needed. Wonderful. Yeah. So when we, when we met, you, you were on this, the other side of coming out of all that. Yeah. Yeah, because this is a low, pretty low point. Not to spectacularize the sin. Right. Um, Isaiah said, you pull me up out of the miry pit. Um, we're all in that pit, uh, just of, of our own making. And it could be any kind of pit. But, oh, yeah. But pulls you out. And then uh, the prayers of a mom, mm -hmm. grandparents. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it could be any, it could be any sin struggle that... Yep. That, you, that you're struggling with or that anybody that's far from the Lord that was once close to the Lord that's now far from the Lord. Yep. Um, but it was those, those prayers. Um, I mean, ultimately we know God does the work, but yep. it was the prayers of those people yep. that uh, were yep. just constant and, and that were praying for me. So that persevering prayer is really important. I'm going to go off track now, okay? Yeah. You ready? Yeah. I don't do this very often, just on days that end in Y. Okay. <laughs> um. I was going to say. <laughs> okay, so... So we're just talking, you're, you're, a, um, uh, you're, you're a server at, uh, at a, okay, I'll just say a, a, a garden. Olive Garden? Okay. I, <laughs> I didn't want to endorse it, but there are days, there are days you're, you, and you work off tips, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And then there are days you don't get tipped, and it, which just, that's, a, I get really honked at that, but anyway, that's my own issue that I talked to my own therapist about, okay? <laughs> so, but that happens with you, and what happens, uh, you, you were just telling us what happens, and tell me, what do you do when you, you say, a person just, they have the ability to tip, they're just not doing it, so what do you do then? Remember this? Yeah. You prayed for them. Yeah, oh. Okay, well. no, okay forgot, didn't you? No, but, yes, yes, so. <laughs> Tiago, just love her. Just, just love. Yes, on those days, yes, sometimes you just gotta, you gotta love. Yeah, because what's no. going on inside them? Yeah. Yeah, sometimes you just have these people. I'm like, I'm serving. I'm like, 
what, like, I have to just step back and know, like, you don't know what they could be going through, what's going on in their lives, like, what could have yep. happened to them that made them this way, Eat this four day. four bowls of soup, 16 sticks. I know, they got me running right. around, back yep. and forth, you know, yep. they yep. want their, they want it quick, they're impatient, you know, yep. but, hey, you know, it's yep. okay, I'm going to pray for them, and I'm going to keep moving through my day. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Do you know that your waitress prays for you? You, you never know, you know? Yeah. It's, I think it's a wonderful t turn that uh, your mom and your grandparents would be pleased with too, yeah. to know that, that you're blessing people out there and who we don't know what their battle is. Exactly. It's a way, because sometimes I was struggling with having to work at just like a secular job so much um, and work so many hours, and I would go in there and be like, I feel meaningless. I'm not fulfilled in my job. Like, what can I do? But yep. that was also a way that I found, and I would find myself so frustrated in my job. Yep. But that was the way that I yep. found to, to bless people and be a blessing yep. there. Well, um, I'm going to pray now. In another day, we'll talk about where you use your job as your mission field. <laughs> And another day we'll talk about that, but that's for another day. Yeah. Today I want to focus on persevering prayer and hanging on good days and bad. Mm -hmm. um, so would you bow with me in prayer? And... Gracious Father, um, the stories that we hear them and then we run parallels of our own stuff and we realize, yeah, there have been people around me who've been praying too. And I, I maybe was aware of it, maybe I wasn't. Like Ashley with the people she serves at the restaurant, she, they may not have any clue, and yet uh, she touches the throne of grace uh, in their behalf. And it's happened with us, and we recognize, Lord, you have been um, not just constant friend and companion in this faith journey, um, but you transform the space around us, particularly when we pray. So may we be persevering in our prayers and never to give up, uh, particularly on the things that really matter, uh, things like our kids and our heritage and our faith, um, about the things we know to be your will. May we never, ever give up. Um, I thank you for these uh, two, and I pray you bless them in their walk with you. For Tiago, as he um, uh, walks out of uh, LBC and starts his career, and for Ashley, as she completes her education. Uh, but may you draw us close and may we be the people who are constantly committed to persevering prayer. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people say amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. to be near to us and he says I'll be a companion to you I send the Holy Spirit the day you believe and I'll be your friend and your counselor and guide I'm in Luke chapter 11 we're going to look at one passage today it's a simple one to revive our hearts O Lord and in this passage Jesus is teaching here's how you pray our Father who's in heaven hallowed be your name you're, you're our holy your kingdom come, your will be done. And he goes through the model of prayer, Luke chapter 11. But then an interesting thing happens as soon as he finishes showing them how to pray. And by the way, that's a great model for prayer. And then you fill in the blanks. God, I want your will to be done. And I don't know what that is, but here's what's on my plate. And help me to forgive people who've wronged me. And may I be forgiving because I want to be forgiven and to yours be the glory and that's that's a great model prayer but he, he adds something at the back that may surprise us number one after the model he shows us the value of persevering in the prayer chapter 11 pick it up at verse 5 then Jesus says to them suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say friend lend me three loaves of bread a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him and suppose the one inside says, don't bother me. The door is already locked. My children are in bed and I can't, give, I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, verse 8, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of your friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, because of your shameless audacity, 
because of your what class? Shameless audacity. There's your two words for the day, big ones. You're going to keep at it. Because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So he can go back to bed, the text says. It doesn't say that. The man has a great need. He says, I have company. I didn't know they were coming. I got bread. I can't grind. I can't get to the store. I can't. They had to make their bread. Bread didn't last like it does today. Bread had a little bit of everything in it, so it had a rot factor. You bake the bread, preserve it, you a couple of days. Once it's a day or two old, they had to pitch it, start over again. He says, I can't do this. I need some bread. Jesus teaches them pray, and then when you don't get the answer, he says, stay at it. Stay at it with shameless audacity. He says, suppose a friend comes to you. A friend at midnight. How many of you have a friend who can come to you? How many of you have a friend that you can go to at midnight? Yeah, you have a, uh, a counselors will talk about you. Everyone needs a 3 a.m. friend. Someone you could call any hour of the day. I want that friend to be that friend who can call any hour of the day, but I don't want him to say, stop calling me, right? I want him to actually pick up and say, what's up? I was just thinking about you. No, this friend says, I am in bed. He, but the guy says, I'm in great need. I've got company. I need three loaves of bread. Just loan them to me. Now, this is complicated. The guy says, I'm not getting up. And, and go back to the text again, verses 5, 6, 7. You, you see what he's saying? He's saying, I am, I'm in bed, dude. He says, I'm, I'm desperate. He says, I, I'm, even though you're supposed to stay at this with shameless audacity, he's saying, the door is locked. The kids are in bed, and I'm in bed. And he's not saying animals, but let me tell you a little bit of the, of the history. And if you go to Europe, you can even see this today. Even in, in as early as the uh, 19th century, as late as the 19th century, houses were built in the lower level of a house. Oftentimes was the barn area, and then the, the humans lived upstairs. So downstairs were the beast, and, and upstairs was the family. And so this guy, when he went to bed, he put like a bar, like a four before board across the door. You understand? Because he's, he's got cows and chickens and horses and goats. And you've got to put big lug types of locks on those doors. It's downstairs. It's where the animals would be. Upstairs then, uh, he's already got the kids there in bed. And in that day too, it was common for them to lay a bed of straw and you put the kids down and then eventually you'd snuggle into bed. But there was just a large bed area. If you get up, other people are going to get up because they're going to feel the motion. Does that make sense? Have you ever gotten, tried to get up and you don't want to get up because you know if you get up, everyone else will get up? We had a rule when our kids were little because I used to get up early, go into the office early. It would be dark. Wanda would say, it's fine. You wake them, you take them. I could slither out of bed. I could shave and shower in the dark. I set my clothes out the night before. I could dress in the dark. See, because you don't want to wake the kids. This guy's in this big straw bed, and he goes, uh, the door is locked. Uh, in other words, the animals are put away. The door is locked. My kids are in bed with me. Don't make me wake up the kids. It'll be a nasty day tomorrow if we wake up the kids. Understand how complicated it is? But because of his shameless audacity, the guy says, okay, I'm coming. I'll get you the bread. So persevere in prayer when you're that desperate, when you can't find another livable way for it to happen. He, he says, I'm desperate. I didn't see this coming, and I need help, and I need it now. And he's saying that on the heels. Get this. This is not a prayer that he prays just when he's in trouble. This is a prayer that he prays after he's prayed, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So he's been praying. So you shouldn't use this just as your fire escape prayer. This comes on a basis of ongoing prayer. But pray perseveringly when you know the alternatives are not livable. Secondly, go down to verses 9 and 10. So he says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you knock. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and anyone who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. He's saying, I will do this. This will work if you will work it the way it's supposed to work. Persevering prayer when you know this is what God wants. Have you ever prayed and not known, should I take the job, not take the job? Should I, should I make the move, not make the move? 
That's when you need the wisdom of the Lord, right? But there are lots of times when you could pray and you already know what God's will is. If you're taking notes, let me give you five things that there are for sure. These things I, I know are God's will for my life and they're God's will for your life. They're God's will for the people around us. So it's not bad to pray. And um, number one, salvation. It's God's will that people be saved. For uh, Second Peter chapter three, he's not willing that any perish. Doesn't want anybody to perish. Um, Matthew 18, Jesus put it this way. It's not the Father's will that even one of those lost sheep be lost. First Timothy, Paul writes it to Timothy and says in chapter two, God wants all men to be saved. That's his desire, it's his will. So when I pray for someone to come to Christ in faith, I know I can pray with confidence and persevering. Why? Because I know that is God's word, it's God's will. But secondly, not only salvation, to be, number two is spirit-filled. Pray that the Holy Spirit would move in people's lives that you be filled with, Ephesians chapter five, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Lord, if you could prompt them so they would move at the inkling of the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. Pray that for your family members, people around you, pray for yourself. Thirdly, pray that people are sanctified, holy. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter four, it's God's will that you be sanctified, that you be set apart as holy. So when you pray for your family members that they be holy before the Lord, that's a good thing to pray for. Fourthly, that they submit to God's word. Uh, Colossians chapter three, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart and let the word of Christ dwell in you. So the word of Christ is inside of you. You, you have put the word into your children and now they grow and, and you're saying, I don't know if they're following the word, so God, would you bring to memory the word they already know from your word and may they live according to your word. So may they submit to the word of God. And then a fifth thing is you can always be praying is that you have a thankful spirit, that you're, that you're always saying thanks. It's God's will that you always give thanks. First Thessalonians chapter five, give thanks in all circumstances. Why? Because we know it is God's will. Give thanks, even when it's tough, even when it's hard, give thanks thanks well so there are times when you're going to ask you're going to seek you're going to knock and why is it going to come because we know it to be God's will you can always go to the bank on that so pray with persevering spirit when you know it is God's will but then verse 11 let's pick it up there verse 11 reads which of you fathers if your son asked for a fish who would give him a snake instead (laughs) stop there he asks for fish, you give him a snake. Who does that? Not a good dad. Okay, that's the answer to that. And, or if he asks for an egg, he gives him a scorpion. Yeah, oh, he asked for an egg, but I, I, I gave him something he'll never forget. No, no, dads like to give good gifts. We, we like to give great gifts. How many dads, how many dads are in the room? How many dads like to put stuff together on Christmas morning? Oh yeah, yeah. Like like when our kids were little, like I liked, we would get stuff and I'd go, oh good, this is a chance for me to go back to the store and get batteries. You ever done that on Christmas day? Oh yeah, yeah, but everything's closed except for those, you know, those little corner little shops that are just, and the prices of batteries just got quadruple on Christmas day because we know you need D-sized batteries. They're eight bucks a piece, buddy. <laughs> yeah, Merry Christmas. You love to give good gifts. You love to see your kids light up, don't you? You love to see that. That's what a dad does. Moms do it too, but dads really like it. You love to put a bike together with the handlebars going the right way. Watch your kid ride, you know. And then, and then I, you, you love to give good gifts to your kids. So he says, who, who of the fathers gives your kids a snake, nobody. Who gives your kid a scorpion? No, no good dad does it. So if you who are evil, verse 13, you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, and you do know how to do that, just how much more will your Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit for those of you who ask? He said, I'll give you. I'm happy to give you. And he's saying that in comparison to what he had just said a paragraph earlier about the father who's in bed with his kids and and the, 
the cattle are down and the doors are locked. He's going, I don't want to get up because if I get up, I'm going to wake them all up and it'll be a mess. He's saying, I, that's not the Father in heaven. I gave you the worst case scenario. Your Father wants to get up and wants to give you the bread. He wants to be there because he's a good Father. So you stay at it with a kind of shameless audacity. Keep on praying. Keep on praying. Now let me clarify something. When we say keep on praying, we are not saying just rant over in vain repetition over and over again. In fact, Jesus warned against that, okay? So you just go, oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. No, it's not. Grow up, get some words, get some full sentences. <laughs> Think we are th prepared through, okay? That's number one. God is not a genie in the bottle either. Don't think, oh, I just run to him and get, uh, he's not a, a Pez dispenser. He's not an automated machine, okay? And, and prayer is not a permit then to be lazy. God may actually have you be part of the solution. Understand that. That's for another day, another message. But God wants us to be persistent in prayer. His name is Ken Blanchard. Many in the room would know who he is. He wrote the bestseller book, One Minute Manager. Uh, Ken Blanchard is one of the, the gurus out there in leadership and management, written over 60 books. He's just, he writes, prolific writer, well sought after speaker. People want to hear what he has to say. Great guy. By the way, he's a believer in Jesus Christ. Um, wonderful guy. Um, he's an American, not only author, entrepreneur, but great businessman. And and uh, people will drive a, a long way to go hear the guy. And many of us in the room have uh, books he's written. Just The One Minute Manager, which became a bestseller for several years. Back in 1982, it was out. And in 84, it was a blockbuster. It has, just that one book has sold 13 million copies. That's a lot of books. But Ken Blanchard would tell you this story. His faith story began in 1957 when he was on a bus touring Cornell University. He was on an orientation bus. And he met a guy there who was also a freshman at Cornell by the name of Phil Hodges. Phil Hodges was a brand new believer in Jesus and had just begun following Christ in faith. And he met Ken Blanchard on the bus and Ken would say, <clears throat> Phil began to pray for me then, then. Well, they would both go through Cornell University Ken would go on, get a master's degree, and then a PhD in leadership, and, and uh, he would go on to be a, on television shows, morning talk shows, and be doing entrepreneurial things, and they would part their ways, but they stayed in some contact. Well, in the 1980s, when the book came out, The One Minute Manager, Phil called him and said, hey, could, could we go for a walk? And Phil is still praying for Ken. It's the 1980s now. He started praying for him in 1957. So they go for a walk on the beach, and he says to Ken, hey, Ken, tell me about the One Minute Manager book. He, says, he said, is that your idea? Did you come up with the words? Somebody else? I mean, is, is are you just that smart or that good? What, what's going on that that many copies would sell? Because it became a New York Times bestseller. And Ken said, I, I don't know. I, it can't be me. It has to be a God thing, because I couldn't be, I'm not that good. And that's all Phil needed and phil began to hand ken um, not only little brochures but little booklets and and then small books that ken would read and then keep praying and then he kept putting other motivational speakers in front of him who were also believers in jesus and they would tell their faith story and then the next one would tell their faith story another one would tell his faith story and in 1999 Ken Blanchard came to faith in Jesus. Phil had prayed for him for over 40 years. Persevering prayer. So I tell you, you have someone that's heavy on your heart, someone that you love. Could be a family member, co-worker. Could be a neighbor. Could be a mom or dad or one of your kids. And you say, I... I, I don't know, I, I've been praying, but it doesn't seem that the Lord is answering. And I, I want you to have an audacious kind of shameless tenacity about your prayer, based upon not only Luke 11, but based upon the other words that come from the scriptures, like Romans 12, 
Be joyful in hope and faithful in prayer. Like Ephesians 6, pray on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and all kinds of requests. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer. Devote yourselves to prayer. Be watchful. Be thankful. In every case, be thankful. Be persistent in your prayer. Amen? Would you bow with me in prayer? Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. And I talk very simply about what it means to to trust Jesus, but you may not be there yet. But this is maybe the day that you trust the Lord. There's a God in heaven who loves you, and he demonstrates that love by giving to us Jesus. That Jesus came to earth, and he paid for the sins of the world by dying on the cross. That was the criminal's way of dying during Roman Empire days. And Jesus paid for your sins and mine that day. The door is wide open for you to welcome him into your heart if you'll do that, but that has to be your decision. And if you've never done that, I just encourage you to do that where you're seated. Pray quietly in your own heart, God, I need Jesus to be my Savior. I trust him now. And I know that that's God's will. He doesn't want you to perish. He doesn't want anybody to perish. I know that he loves you. He's demonstrated that over and over again. So don't even question that. Instead, welcome him into your life. And then for many of us in the room, you'd say, you know, I've, I've done that already, but I don't welcome him into my schedule. I certainly don't pray my day, my way through my day. And I'm beginning to see I could be doing that. But, but there are times I've prayed and then given up in prayer. And so... Your prayer right now is, Lord, make me shamelessly audacious. May I be tenacious, persistent in my prayer. And Lord, may we never give up on what we know to be your will and pray that through every day to your glory, knowing that when we reach upward, we touch a bit of heaven and the life change that could be possible. So, Lord, may we commune with you, enjoy you, but may we be persistent in our prayers, we pray. And I ask this in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen.